thank the, um, the hosts for inviting me. Uh, this is a, one of my favorite subjects, and it's a real privilege to be here with a great selection of other speakers. Um, so my task today, Michael's actually touched on a number of things, as he said he did, uh, for everybody's talks. But mine is specifically on heart-lung interactions during spontaneous breathing. So I'm going to lay out some general principles on the spontaneous part, which are going to be important as we go through the next few days uh, and looking at the applications of these. So what are the primary factors? For me, the primary factor, the most important, and this very complicated subject, as you just heard from Michael, the primary variable is the change in pleural pressure, which I think is what Michael said too. The second one that comes up, not as importantly in spontaneous breathing, so I'll refer to it less, uh, uh, less is changes in transpulmonary pressure. Now there's modifiers, and Michael also mentioned the importance of uh, volume, so fluid balance becomes important. Another variable we have to think about is frequency in both heart rate and respiratory rate, because we have two time-varying functions that are interfering. And then there's some measurement issues that can get us into big trouble if we don't pay attention to these. And that's the importance of transmural pressure. Now, as I said, the subject is complicated, but if it's broken down into parts, it actually isn't so bad. There's negative, breath negative breath breaths and positive. I'm going to be just dealing with the negative. You have to think of the effects on the right side and left side, and then you have to think of the in and out. And these are modified somewhat by neural inputs, uh, sustained versus cyclic effects, and then the series effect, and it's something called, what I've called pulmonary buffering. So my task today is negative. We're going to just deal with the effects on the right side and left side, and I will go through the systematic parts on the ins and outs of each of these. Now let me start with the methodological issue, the point about transmural pressure and a reference value. So the important uh, force for distending a ventricle, distending a vessel, for capillary filtration is inside minus outside, which we call transmural pressure. The problem is we reference our catheters, our transducers, to atmosphere. And this will show you an example of that process. So let's say we have a box which surrounds the, the heart, this red thing, or, or a balloon in this case. And we have a person sitting inside with a monitor, a person outside measuring the pressure changes across the box, and another person measuring the hemodynamic pressures in this balloon outside the box, which is what we do. This is us over here. So we start off with what happens with the box. We lower the pressure as shown here, and you see there's this fall in pressure. The person at D outside sees the fall in pressure with inspiration. So that could be a fall in right atrial pressure, a fall in pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, and it looks like it goes down. As you think about your pressure volume relationships, if we have a fall in pressure, that means there should be a fall in volume. So this person says this balloon is getting smaller. But the person inside sees this happen. He sees the pressure rise and says, hey, the balloon is actually getting bigger. So which is it? Well, the right answer is the person inside because he is properly referenced to the balloon versus this person who is outside. And you'll notice this one went down by two lines. This one went down by one line. So minus two minus minus one is plus one. The pressure actually rose, even though it looks to us on the outside like it went down. So let's now, with that little background, let's get on to what happens uh, uh, with the heart and the lungs. But before I do that, I need this little primer on how the return of blood comes back to the heart and how the heart uh, deals with it. So the model I like to think of is an elastic balloon that's emptying through a resistance. And what the heart does in this model, it is permissive. By lowering the downstream pressure, it allows that balloon to empty. So you fill the va vasculature, which is an elastic balloon. It's got a recoil pressure. And what you have done with the heart, you've lowered the pressure, and you allow it to empty. And the, the determinants of flow in that simple system is how much I filled it above this resting volume, the stress volume, how stretchy it is, the compliance, and the downstream resistance. Now, the heart has a very important second role, and that's a, what I call a restorative function. It has to put the volume back. So it's allowing it to come back and putting it back. But it can never put out more than what's in this, that the recoil force from this balloon, because that's where the bulk of the volume is. It can add a very small amount from the lungs, but it's a minor factor. 
So in the simple model, we have a stressed volume that can come out, an unstressed volume that is below the emptying, comes back to a heart, and the heart pumps it out. And then the actual cardiac output is determined by the function of the heart, the cardiac function, Starling's law, and this return function, which determines how the blood drains back, which was well described by Arthur Guyton in the 50s and 60s. And Arthur Guyton provided a very useful graphical tool, which really helps us understand the heart-lung interactions. So I'm going to briefly go through this. We have flow on the y-axis, right atrial pressure on the x-axis. So when the pressure in the heart, the right atrial pressure, is equal to the upstream pressure in that tank, the big compliant region with the volume, the we have a mean systemic filling pressure. That's the elastic force stretching the vasculature uh, at rest. So we start off with the x-axis, and the right atrial pressure is zero. And the heart, when it lowers right atrial pressure with this permissive function, permissive uh, role, it allows more flow to come back to a maximum, which is determined by collapse of the great vessels as they enter the thorax. The slope of this line is minus 1 over the resistance draining the tank. It's just Purcell's law. Upstream pressure, downstream, the resistance between them. So we can put the heart in there with a cardiac function curve, it's the same axes, and where it intersects the venous return curve determines the working um, cardiac output and the working right atrial pressure. Now on this graph, an important part from the zero point here for the cardiac function curve to the working value is the cardiac preload. And on the other side, from the mean systemic filling pressure to that uh, right atrial pressure is the gradient for venous return. Two other important points. Once you reach this collapse point, then you, the re venous return is cardiac independent. You can take out the heart from the body, you will have exactly the same flow. Because the great veins collapse as they have a pressure inside, less than outside, and the heart can't do any better. And on the other side, you have this flat part of the cardiac function curve where it's limited by the pericardium in an intact heart, or even without a pericardium by the cardiac cytoskeleton, and gives a, a volume limit to the uh, cardiac output. All right, so now we're ready to look at spontaneous inspiration. I'll begin with the simplest part, and probably the most important, which is the inflow to the right heart. Michael finished off by saying the right heart is really important, and we really have often neglected this part of the heart. Um, so taking the simple model with the compliance in the veins and the compliance in the arteries outside the chest, a right heart and left heart, the compliance is inside. When we're, chained, when, we're, when we're inspiring, the pleural pressure is affecting all these compartments together, the right heart, left heart, and the compliant regions together. <clears throat> so from, with the venous return curve, when I lower pleural pressure, that lowers the heart relative to the atmosphere. It's as if I just took the heart and I lowered it. So this cardiac function curve moves to the left. Actually, let me go back for a second. Notice that I started this curve slightly negative, and that's because the heart's in the chest, and at end expiration, at FRC, the pleural pressure is slightly negative. So the heart starts out in an environment that's slightly negative relative to the rest of the body. So when we breathe in, the heart is going to become more negative, so it shifts to the left. And that's what you do on each breath. You're getting a little more negative and back again, a little bit more negative and back again and a little bit more negative, and back again. So at, end, at, the, at the lowest point of inspiration, your right atrial pressure falls relative to atmosphere, which means we have increased the gradient for re venous return. And as Michael has already said to you, you increase the return of blood to the heart during inspiration. So filling of the right ventricle increases during inspiration. Now, if you started off at this collapse point, this was the point where the pressure in veins is less than the pressure outside. <clears throat> if you're breathing with atmosphere, this would be at zero. If you're breathing with a positive end expiratory pressure, CPAP, it would be at a positive value. And now when you do this, you'll notice the pleural pressure moves again, heart again moves to the left, right atrial pressure falls, but there's no change in filling. So here, the right atrial pressure falls, there's no increase in filling. So the clinical point here is the volume status determines the inspiratory increase in venous return. So if you start off with a right atrial pressure above zero, then your inspiratory efforts can actually increase your venous return. But if you start off close to zero, they won't, or close to the pleural pressure if you're uh, on PEEP. 
Now, if the return function intercepts the plateau of the cardiac function curve, we have a very interesting phenomenon. Now, as you breathe in, you'll see there's no change in right atrial pressure and no change in filling of the heart. And this difference between this pattern and the other can actually be used to determine whether you're on the flat part of the cardiac function curve and whether you're going to be volume responsive. Now, an important contributor as we're looking at heart-lung interactions, which makes it very difficult to understand in the intact person or animal, is the series effect. Because the blood's coming from the right heart, passing through all the structures in the thorax, getting to the left heart, and out again. Which means the left heart can only pump what the right heart gives it. So once you have an effect on the right heart, that has to get passed on to the left heart. Now, the left heart can also affect what's coming out of the right, but not as easily because it has to fill up that pulmonary circuit. And you have to accumulate a lot of volume to do that. You do in the steady state, but it has to be a lot more. But in any case, these two are linked. Uh, and importantly, what comes out of the left has to first come out of the right because there's no other real sources of volume to do otherwise except on a couple of beats. Now, <clears throat> what about the effect of lung inflation on the inflow to the left heart? So this was alluded to before, although Michael and I actually disagree on this point somewhat. I go back to more of the experiments of Permit. He's referring to the ones of Wittenberg and McGregor, and I forgot two other authors, but McGregor was the person who recruited me to Montreal and actually disagrees with that figure. So in this view, you have the alveoli, you have these corner vessels, or intra-alveolar, and in, sorry, inter-alveolar, or intra, I'm not sure which one it should be, but somebody can correct me after. So these vessels between the alveoli and these in the corners. So when you inflate the lungs, the outer ones don't really change much if your central venous pressure, uh, your, sorry, your left atrial pressure is above three, because they're already distended. But what you do do is you squeeze the vessels between them and therefore squeeze some blood out of the lungs and into the left heart. So left heart filling slightly increases during inspiration, whether it's spontaneous or whether it's positive pressure. This is due to the change in transpulmonary pressure. So generally, you have a small increase in left heart filling. So this has importance when you're actually making your pressures uh, in somebody breathing spontaneously. This is an example of somebody with an elevated right atrial pressure. Uh, no, it's a, I think it's a pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. So here you can see with the breath, they're taking a deep inspiratory effort, which is marked here. And then what you see is, and so if you just took the mean, you would get this value. You should know that the proper place to measure it, measure it is end expiration, because that's when the cardiac pressures or pleural pressure is closest to atmosphere. So that's the proper place. But in fact, if you actually were measuring the transpulmonary pressure, you'd see that the pressure was actually rising because you were filling it from that open, uh, lung inflation. And so the real value is even a bit higher than we actually measure it, but you don't know that. So we always make our measurements at end expiration because that's as close as we can get to a pleural pressure that's close to atmosphere. Now, what about the outflow from the right heart? I'm only very going to briefly me mention this. Uh, I might get into it in my talk tomorrow. The big point is, as you raise transpulmonary pressure, that actually can compress the vessels and create a zone two condition and create an obstruction to the flow going through the system. And when that happens, it doesn't actually stop flow, but the alveolar pressure becomes the downstream pressure and creates a considerable load to the right ventricle. And I think an important part of Antoine's studies uh, on the heart with core pulmonale and lung inflation. Now with spontaneous breathing, this may actually even occur in more severe cases. Tough to know. Uh, I put this figure out for people to comment to me afterwards, but this is an example of somebody, this is the, uh, wedge, this is the, the esophageal pressure measured with a fluid-filled balloon, that's why it's not zero. Inflation pressure at the uh, airway, and this is the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, which is markedly rising, much more than the change in pleural pressure, which is actually going down. And I don't have the right atrial pressure on this, but I have it on another figure. It actually doesn't change at all. So this marked rise in pulmonary artery pressure makes me wonder whether this person was actually developing zone two conditions in the lung and causing a further load to the right heart. So what about the outflow from the left ventricle? Well, Michael again alluded to this point. I'm going to use a slightly different model. So if we had an isolated heart, a Langendorf preparation, and the pressure was 100 millimeters of mercury uh, with each pulse. So this line marks 100 millimeters in the column. And the outside is atmosphere. 
And now I surround it with a negative pressure of minus 40. And so, as Michael said to you, you now have to add that 40 to get up to that, that height. So at the same time as Michael was actually, actually just before Michael was at Stanford, the same person who actually initiated his experiments was a person he didn't get to know, but a person named Sam Lichtenstein, who worked with a very close friend of both of ours, who's the real inspiration on this, which is Saul Permit. So this person came to work uh, with me, and Andy Buddha went off to Stanford, who ended up working with Michael, and so the same source. So he did the volumes, and I did the pressures. We should have put them together. It would have been a better paper. So here's the Mueller procedure from the pressure point of view. So what this shows is arterial pressure going from 0 to 160. Here is the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, now put at 0 because it's going to become negative with the procedure. So the person takes a little breath in, they push a little bit, and then you'll see the mouth pressure they pull in to minus 40, and they hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, release. So when you have a Mueller maneuver, you have no change in lung volume. If you have no change in lung volume, a change in airway pressure equals change in pleural pressure. So this is a way of seeing a change in pleural pressure uh, without, by measuring mouth pressure. So here the, the transpulmonary is shown here. And you'll notice the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure falls, but it keeps on rising almost back to the uh, zero point. So the change in pressure across this is plus 5 to minus 5. It looks like it's still negative. But the transpulmonary, transmural pressure here is the minus 40 from the, is the minus 10 from the 5 to 5, so minus 10, minus the outside pressure, which is minus 40. It actually went up by 30 millimeters of mercury. So even though this value looks like it's below zero, it's really about 35 millimeters of mercury. And if you do a chest x-ray on somebody doing a Mueller, and Saul Permit did this on himself, it looks like he's in pulmonary edema. It's transient, because your veins are all distended. But if you do it recurrently, as Michael was saying to you, you actually can go into pulmonary edema. So a very strong force affecting the uh, flows across the capillaries. You can see these big V waves forming, which are not there at the beginning as the left atrium gets distended. So just to finish off, uh, one way, another way of looking at this is looking at the standard pressure volume relationship of the ventricle, in this case, the left ventricle. So you all know the classic loop. We have isovolumetric uh, contraction. The valve opens, you eject, you return, and you come back again. And this dotted line shows the aortic valve opening. So if we now decrease pleural pressure, that takes this whole figure and moves it down because the heart's now in a more negative environment. So everything is shifted down. So there's, there's some interesting things to note here. First of all, I need a bigger rise before the aortic valve would open at the same pressure. And importantly, which you'll notice, the end systolic pressure volume line, that measurement of contractility, is moved to the right simply by the graphics, as I've shown you. I've just moved the exact same figure down, but you get this rightward shift. So what that does, it means you have this higher end systolic volume, and you have this decrease in stroke volume. So on that first beat, you have a very large afterload effect on the ventricle. It quickly begins to adjust as things happen, but on that first beat, you have a very substantial effect. And what that means is on the next beat, you're going to start from a higher end diastolic volume to actually bring things back again as more comes back because you've impeded what went out. OK, so just to finish. So for me, the dominant factor in heart-lung interactions is the change in pleural pressure relative to atmosphere. An increase in pleural pressure, um, that should have been increases, uh, venous return and, uh, no, uh, increase, I did reverse this one. I got it right, sorry, <laughs> got a little dyslectic. So an increase in pleural pressure decreases venous return and cardiac output. A decrease in pleural pressure increases venous return and cardiac output when the cardiac output is not limited. Transpulmonary pressures become important when you develop West Zone 1 and 2 conditions. The left heart can only put out what the right heart gives it in the steady state. Don't get fooled by pressures relative to atmosphere. And the effects of ventilation on the heart are dependent upon blood volume, systemic and pulmonary, as well as cardiac function. Thank you. Thank you.